in this session, we are going to talk about persistent identifiers, which is one of my favorite topics as a, as a PIDS nerd uh, for at least the last 10 years in the data space. Um, we're going to talk you through uh, what they are and the identifier services that we offer uh, through ARDC and how you can leverage them uh, in your projects. Uh, and then we are going to hand to Melroy to talk through the AAF single sign on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just starting with an acknowledgement of country. So, we acknowledge Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respect to the elders past and present. So, I'm in Brisbane, so this is the Turbul and the Yagura peoples. So, persistent identifiers going to start with um, what the requirements are for the ARDC project co investments. So, we've already had about the, um, the way that the ARDC encourages our projects to produce FAIR data outputs. And for these reasons, because we are such strong FAIR evangelists, um, and it is part of our interest guidelines as well, that it's a condition of ARDC investment that the project outputs must have appropriate persistent identifiers, because PIDs are one of the backbone pieces in FAIR. So there are two, um, we have a, uh, a um, policy guidelines that you can access uh, for the projects on the website there. So there's a link down the bottom. So this is around the metadata describing the outputs that you produce should use the PIDs, persistent identifiers, when referring to project activity and project inputs. And there are a range of examples there from funding to samples, instruments, organizations. And if there are exceptions, then you just need to document those. So we have a suite of PID services that we offer through ARDC and in uh, collaboration with the AAF led Australian Orchid Consortium, they're the backbone of enabling fair research outputs via PIDs in Australia. So through our data and services portfolio, we provide to the sector DOIs, digital object identifiers, and the service, through the ARDC service, you can mint DOIs for research data, software, grey literature, and also for research instruments. We also have RAIDS, the Research Activity Identifier. That's an identifier for research projects. And um, Siobhan will explain that later in the piece and how that's different to grants. We have IGSN, objects collected during the course of research. We the PEARLS service, which identifies research grants mainly for the ARC and NHMRC and provides uh, a landing page for those uh, through the Research Data Australia portal. And we also have a handle service um, and that's for uh, for data that it doesn't isn't yet at the stage where it's being published and requires the DOIs and handles are also used in RAIDs as well. So these PIDs are captured and displayed in our Research Data Australia service where they're also harvested by international partners. So it's part of exposing Australian research data uh, to the world. So just backtracking a little bit into what is a persistent identifier and just adding thanks to Peter Palooza, is an example of that happens every year that uh, the whole international PID community generally is involved in. And uh, we helped uh, contribute to this development of a slide deck around PIDs 101. So this is a portion of that deck. So what is a persistent identifier? First of all, it's persistent. Um, that is, it's going to be around for a long time. We can't really say forever. I don't think anyone can really say forever, but for a long time. And that's a promise that the organization makes to keep it alive and the PID provider as well. Um, and it's also unique. So many people can have the same name. So there may be many John Smiths and a persistent identifier is a unique ID that would be used to identify one of those John Smiths. And if you take the um, persistent identifier example, orchid, um, if you assign a John Smith an orchid, then that orchid will link that John Smith with the works that he produces, regardless of the ways in which his name is referenced in the articles that he produces. So um, J Smith or whatever, it links it all that way. So uh, there are of PIDs in research. Um, so we 
have PIDs for people, for the researchers and contributors, and um, some of those types of PIDs that you can use are ISNIs, but the main one that's being used in Australia is ORCIDs. Um, also, get PIDs for bases, which are research organisations, and the PIDs that you can use for that are GRID and RAW, um, slightly different types of organisation registries, uh, but I can talk through that later if people are interested in that. We also have PIDs for things, so research inputs, uh, grants and so forth, and those are uh, issued through Crossref and DataCite, who are registration agencies for digital object identifiers, the ASN RAIDs, and a whole lot more. Um, so this is an interesting slide because it shows. So if you look at that original sentence in the mid in the middle there, a persistent identifier is a long lasting reference to a digital resource. Well, it's actually a reference to a resource because it can re reference physical things. There's metadata collected in the course of minting a PID, so uh, to so that you can tell more about who is minting it and what it's about. Um, it has a machine readability aspect. Um, there's a lot of policies and guarantees around PIDs to make sure that when you do mint them, they they do last. <clears throat> and there's provenance information around a persistent identifier that's collected as well in the metadata. So what can PIDs do and why are they important? Well, first of all, they help disambiguate. So I gave that example before of John Smith, but you can see as well in this ORCID example that it collects the name variations for, in this case, Robin Dazzler, um, and it gives her that the PID there is the ORCID identifier at the top. And down below, you can see she's got other IDs that are collected on the ORCID record, um, in this case, the research ID. So they help to disambiguate and link a researcher to their works. They also support linking. Um, so you want to be very sure in scholarly communications that you're citing the right material. Um, so uh, something like a digital object identifier, you can be sure that um, the reference that you're looking for is that thing that's the, that has that DDOI and not a whole lot of other things that look very similar. Um, and they also support linking between articles and uh, data as well through those DOIs. They collect metadata and they enable interoperability between different systems. So they could be systems that operate within a university or external systems, say publishers, different publisher systems that can exchange information. They also help make research fair, the findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, which we've gone through in quite a lot of detail. And there's a lot of references to PIDs and collecting metadata that are important in um, making research outputs fair. They also support a trustworthy research infrastructure. So they help us um, track things from grants through to publication through the research life cycle. Um, and uh, be able to say that that thing, that grant is related to uh, that publication, is related to that data set and so forth. And that helps to build trust in the system right from the start. So he, um, a number of PIDs that you collect together can be used to form what we call a PID graph. And that um, this, this is a very, um, this is we want to be able to make more of <laughs> this type of thing. And I have to say that Melroy is the expert in PID graphs here. So if you have any questions around that, um, he is the one to ask. But you can see that if all of these different things, authors, publications, data sets, institutions have persistent identifiers, and those identifiers describe the relationships between those things, then you can start to do some very rich querying. So you could start to say, I'm an institution, give me this particular grant, give me all the um, articles that were produced from that grant, all the data, all the authors that were associated with that. Um, and so you can start to see a wide network of co-authors and relationships between those objects. Um, so uh, this is something that uh, is, there's a version of this available in Research Data Australia, so you'll be able to see it on some of the records. Um, but there's also a number of PDFs in production uh, across those different things. So we'll see the sections on that at the end. But it shows you the potential of what we can do um, PIDs as we assign them across the system. So PIDs are part of national uh, infrastructure. So we have the national 
It's about creating nationally significant assets, facilities, and services support leading research. And PCIs are a core component of this national infrastructure key to world global research infrastructure. So we think that by making the entities governance and attribution, the PIDs are like foundation for improved tracking and impact, which you can see in that graph. Um, and by precise inputs and of research, the PIDs contribute to research well. And by linking scientific co concepts, systems, and efficiency, which is different to the, the poly projects, so they want to explore the our policy a bit further. But just to cap off on that, um, place a high value on the use of PIDs in research and we offer PID services to the Australian research sector to facilitate their uptake. Um, for example, instruments and data literature for the research sector. We pay to data sites so that your organisations can use that service to mint those DOIs. Part of the strategy to optimise sustainable longevity and global acceptance, um, our PID services offered in partnership with international PID services. I mentioned that. Um, the election that we have been announced is fantastic. Natasha, what, Natasha, sorry to what the technical Your infrastructure is, really is we look at the governance. Yeah. Okay. Is that better? I'll sit a bit closer. Yeah, it's, that it's your connection. Could you maybe maybe turn off your video? I don't know how to. I don't think I can do that without stopping the share. Just a second. Is that better? No. Yeah, it is. It is better? Yep. Okay. Well, I hope you heard what <laughs> Okay, so just to recap, Holly has that our PID services is offered um, in collaboration with international PID advisors, data site orchid and cross that we have a criteria looking at what PIDs we include in our services suite, looking around the attributes of good PID systems um, and their technical act architecture, um, governance structures they have around them, and also the community uptake of those, as well as cost effectiveness and sustainability. Um, and just mention that the AIC as well is very very active in the international community. We serve on a number of boards internationally, um, committees and projects and initiatives, which help us in contributing to the internationally as um, adoption. And um, I will now hand Joel to talk about which peers get from us and how you get them. Thanks, Natasha. Um, so, uh, which PIDs can you get from AODC and how do you get them? So, as Natasha has already mentioned, um, AODC offers a suite of identifier services uh, through its partnerships with international PID providers. Uh, so, we have a DOI, IDSN, Handle and Ray. So, DOI enables the creation of uh, persistent identifiers for data associated workflows, software models, and grey literature. And ADC actually provides access to data site services directly. So through our consortium membership model, uh, we provide uh, users access to the data site interfaces and APIs directly. Uh, we also have an IGSN service. So this is persistent identifiers for physical samples and specimens. Um, and originally IGSM was very much focused on the earth sciences domain or discipline, um, and it has been broadened out to any sort of research physical samples and specimens. Uh, the handle service is more of a general purpose persistent identifier. It can pretty much be uh, um, associated with any sort of research entity. Um, and it's generally used where 
Uh, and other identifiers such as the DOI is not appropriate or, or usable in those instances. Uh, the RAID services, and Natasha has already mentioned, uh, is all about research projects and being able to provide sort of a linkage to research projects and provenance, et cetera, and Siobhan will go into that in a little bit more detail. Now, each of the services, they, they cover a different use case uh, in the research ecosystem and they have their own governance models, as Natasha has sort of alluded to. They support the creation, obviously, of persistent and globally unique identifiers and they're free for use uh, by Australian researchers and research organisations and institutions. So as Natasha said, the ADC is currently covering costs um, to be mem members of those international uh, system identifier organisations. Um, and then we enable the access to the services through those memberships. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of interacting with the services, uh, there's obviously a number of ways. Uh, most, the easiest way, I guess, is through our web interfaces. So all of the services have web interfaces and they enable the creation and management of the persistent identifiers through a browser. They're primarily used to create smaller numbers of records, uh, identifiers. So you possibly wouldn't want this if you were creating thousands of DOIs or handles, et cetera, um, but they do allow you to get up to speed pretty quickly. And the interfaces, they assist in creating rich metadata records. And they do this in, in a number of ways. So a lot of the forms that we have, they'll have in-context help for each of the fields so that you'll be able to see, uh, see what's sort of expected in those metadata fields. You'll be able to see the vocabularies. Um, and we also have widgets in, in some of the, the forms that we have. So the example on the right, there is a, an ORCID widget. And that, when you're filling out an IGSN metadata uh, form, it allows you to uh, look up a researcher. Uh, through their surname or, or first name and surname, and I'll actually pull back the awkward information and pre-populate the fields for you. Um, and we also have things uh, which allow you to link to grants and Research Data Australia and map widgets that allow you to find some sort of spatial regions when you're filling out the forms. Uh, so that, that obviously assists you in creating really nice rich records that are, that are obviously good to share and, and provide sort of that fair um, principles within your metadata. Uh, another advantage of the forms is that there's no technical skills or expertise required. So if you can use a browser, you can pretty much log into the service and, and get up to speed pretty quickly in using the service. You also don't need to understand the underlying metadata. So a lot of the services, uh, you obviously got a metadata component that is associated with the uh, persistent identifier and using the interfaces, you don't actually need to understand the, the metadata schema at all. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the other way to interact with the services is through APIs. So all services uh, contain APIs. Um, it's a mix of uh, sort of remote procedure call and REST APIs. Um, and they allow you obviously to integrate with your applications, platforms and services to automate the creation and management of identifiers. And obviously this is probably the most efficient way uh, to get um, large numbers of identifiers to sort of integrate them within your workflows and processes in your software. Um, but there is obviously, that while they're not overly complicated, the APIs, there is obviously some expertise, technical expertise that's going to be required within your projects or, or development team um, to integrate those APIs. But as always, AADC is here to help and uh, we have a pretty good technical team on board that can assist you uh, with any of the things that pop up as you start to sort of tinker with the services. Next slide. Uh, so in terms of sort of exploring service and testing and doing integration testing, et cetera, uh, we have sandbox with the uh, demonstration environments for all of our services. Um, so we can easily set you up with some test credentials where you can kick the tires, have a look around, see what's involved in creating identifiers and actually mint um, some test identifiers for each of the services. And yeah, as I said, just sort of see what's involved uh, in using the services. You'll have access to both the web UI and APIs in those environments. Um, so it's pretty much like production service. You can use it for your integration testing. Um, and there's obviously really, there's a lot of documentation and stuff to, to help you get up to speed with that. And again, ARDC technical support is, is available um, wherever it's needed. Uh, next slide. In terms of uh, obtaining a, a service account, um, so what I've got here is, is sort of a general procedure to obtain a production account. Um, if you are looking just to use the test service, uh, you can talk to any of the AADC contacts or email the services desk and we can set you up a, a test account pretty easily. But in terms of a production account, um, normally how it works is that the applicant will discuss uh, or the client will discuss their sort of interest in using the service 
with uh, one of their contact points at AIDC, whether that's the services team and engagements officer or your project contact at AIDC. And then generally there's a, an, a service policy statement uh, around each of the services that just uh, outlines sort of what you can expect from AIDC in terms of the service delivery and what, your, what our expectations of you are in using the service. Um, and then there's obviously a, uh, usually a participation agreement uh, to use the production service that you sign and then send through to the services team. And then they'll set you up a, an account and send you through the details and point you off to the documentation, et cetera. Um, so pretty, pretty straightforward um, procedure for each of our services. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, service documentation. So under documentation.aidc.edu.au, we have uh, pretty much all the documentation except for RAID in our services. We will be incorporating RAID very shortly. Uh, RAID has its own pages of documentation, which uh, Siobhan can point you to or can point you to at the end of the session. Um, but in each of these sort of um, sections, you'll find information about what the service does, um, what's involved in using the service, how you, how you get an account, and it'll actually go down in sort of the technical details on each of the API endpoints, how you use them and, and what's necessary to provide on each of those API calls. Next slide. And I'll hand over to Siobhan now. Thanks very much, Joel, and thanks Natasha as well. Um, so I'm going to take you on a, a fairly rapid unpacking of RAIDs and the ARDC investment identifier. So when, uh, when your project is given the stamp to go ahead, you'll be given two persistent identifiers, an investment identifier and a RAID. So first of those is the ARDC investment identifier. Um, you'll, you'll be allocated it. It's a DOI. Um, we minted at ARDC through the Crossref DOI registry uh, on your behalf, um, and it will be uh, passed on to you by your, your project liaison or, or um, manager. Um, and that identifier will resolve to the project page of the ARDC website. So next page, page please. Oh, next one, please. Grand. So why do we want you to have uh, access to use this identifier? The main reason uh, for yourselves is attribution. All of the ARDC investments require you to um, attribute the investment in your talks and materials, so posters, websites, brochures, uh, and any publications. Um, and we'd like you to use this DOI to do that attribution. That means it's always gonna have a permanent place that people can find it uh, and very useful for other tracking activities as well. Um, okay. And we'll move on to the next page, please. Thank you. So the second of the identifiers that you'll be given for your project is a RAID. So RAID is a, a unique identifier for projects. Um, it acts as an envelope with a, a metadata manifest that collects other persistent identifiers that your project will encounter during the course of its activities. I want to be really clear that it's not for grants. Um, it's for a project which we view as an activity research project is an activity. It takes place over a period of time. It's got set bounds or scope. Um, it's resourced by researchers and support staff, and it uses and produces data. Um, and it may also interact with other institutions and organizations. So it's not a grant. A grant is uh, awarded to a project to do the research activity. Next page, please. And just how does RAID work? RAID has two parts, an identifier and the metadata envelope, as I mentioned. The identifier uses the ARDC handle service that Joel went through briefly. Um, the handle is a number that you could probably think of as being an address in an envelope or uh, on a, a folder, something similar. Um, we've got a nice picture of it here that kind of looks how it looks in my head. Um, and it's made up of other identifiers that represent project activities and describe the relationship between them. So in that metadata envelope, we have grants and investments, organisations and institutions, 
collaborators, that's those people that resource the project. Tools and services, uh, that could include cloud services or it could be uh, instrumentation, also data and publications. And the very first identifier that will go into your brain is the AIDC investment identifier. So that Crossref DOI will automatically be added to your RAID. Next page, please. Next page, please. Yeah, there we go. And what are the benefits of using RAID? So RAID is used to establish data provenance. You can also use it for auditing, collecting metrics on facilities and instrument use. Um, it can be used as well for, for tying in grant access authorization and for reflecting the roles of individuals in the research process, which is something that Melroy will go through in, in a little bit more depth. So the benefits of using the RAID are that it, it can really help create a timeline of the interactions of your project. It can help you get insights into investments and activities, things like cooperation, it can help make those PID graphs really nice and rich. It can help to develop better strategic intelligence on the outcomes for each of the investments. It can generate better evidence and understanding of impact and its impact of funding as well as impact of staffing as well as the impact of the research itself. It can save time on administration and reporting, particularly if you can automate those systems and it can provide better tools for analysis and decision support. Next page, please. How do you update a RAID? So if a RAID is something that has other persistent identifiers listed in its metadata manifest, how do you update it? Well, once you've been given a RAID, the ownership of that RAID is transferred to your project, to your organization, and you'll be able to update and add identifiers to it using either the RAID web in interface or by integrating it with the platform of your choosing um, via the RAID API. And if you have questions about that, AIDC can assist you in uh, finding the best way to use it for your project. So looking at your workflows, et cetera, and also just how to do that integration. So next one, please. And last but not least, here's the contact point and further information. All of these services are on our websites um, and there's much more information and documentation and in the particular identify services website. Thank you very much. And I think